So Hebrews chapter 3, and we'll read from verse 1. We'll read the whole chapter. <clears throat> what we have in this chapter, and for a good part of the next chapter, there is a warning. And uh, we'll only look at chapter 3, but the warning goes on into chapter 4. And so uh, we'll start with verse 1 of chapter 3. If everybody's got it, I haven't got my glasses on, so uh, I can't see. Prince is looking very uh, keenly at something there, so we'll just make sure everybody's got the chapter. Oh, he's doing it three times, that's why. Um, and we'll start from verse 1. Thank you very much for that. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honour than the house. For every, ma every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house, as a servant, for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house. Whose house are we? If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if ye will hear his voice... Harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my wrath, into my rest, sorry. If we could just go back, please, uh, to verse 7, and let's just read that first word, wherefore, now please come to verse 12, wherefore, take heed, brethren, so verse 12, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke. Howbeit, not all that came out of Egypt uh, came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? Verse eighteen. And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest? But to them that believed not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief and we trust that God will bless the reading of his word when we come across a word like wherefore at the beginning of our chapter we know that we need to look back a little bit to see what the connection is it isn't just one of those words that's put in to make it sound good it does serve a purpose. So if you find a chapter that starts therefore or wherefore or something like that, you should look back to the previous chapter to get some idea of the connection. And in this case, we have wherefore consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. What's this wherefore here? Well, in the first two chapters, the Lord Jesus has been exalted and shown to be superior to the angels. We have the superiority of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have also the wonderful fact that he is willing to call us brethren. And so if he is the superior one, and he is willing to call us brethren, we should consider him. And that's what this chapter starts out, and it says, Wherefore, 
consider the the apostle and high priest of our profession. Now, of course, I've missed out a little bit, which is just the people to whom this verse is addressed. It says, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. And this is the wonderful thing, is that those of us that have our faith and trust firmly rooted in the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work on Calvary's cross, we are holy brethren. We are those who are partakers of the heavenly calling. We're not just looking to see what's going to happen here on earth. What happens here in our life is not the end of it all. We're looking forward to a day when we shall be with the Saviour. We shall enter into our rest. And so we have, we're asked to consider the apostle and high priest of our profession. Now of course, if we profess something, it's something we say that we believe. And in this case, it's not just something, it is someone. Now many people will believe in their religions and they will believe in their creeds and they will believe in their codes and they will believe that these creeds and these codes are what will get them to whatever they would like to call heaven. You know, whether you call it Shangri-La, Nirvana, Valhalla or whatever you want to call it, that's where they think it's going to get them. And if they follow their code, some of them think if they die in a blaze of glory, that's going to get them into, the, into, into their heaven. The, the Vikings used to believe that. And, you know, sadly, there are people that, uh, that believe that today. It's going to get them quickly to see their, their vestal virgins and what have you. But we don't believe in a code. We don't believe in a creed. We believe in a person. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our apostle and high priest Christ Jesus. We believe in a man, but we look at these verses and we see that he is more than just a man. Yes, he was a man. That's why to the Hebrews they could say he, he, was, he was made a man and they would call him brethren. Here is somebody that walked and talked. He asked the disciples, give me to eat. So he was a real man. He sat down at the well side. He was tired and said, give me to drink. He was a real man. And he, was, he is pleased to call us brethren. But it is the man that we trust in. The finished work of the cross. And it's the person that we believe in. Not whether or not I've managed to tick off the Ten Commandments. Whether I've managed to do all the other little things. Like the, the, the tithing, the, the coming and the... I can't remember the other thing it was. You know, the little things they had to do. They give them the 10%, you know. I, I, I'm a little bit of an aside here, please forgive me for this, I probably shouldn't have a little bit of a swipe, but I do notice that those churches where the man at the front relies on income is very keen to get them to believe in tithing, uh, to, to make sure that his income is there uh, come payday, you know, uh, we, we don't tithe, I don't believe as Christians we tithe, I believe as Christians we give everything, he is our Lord and what is necessary we give. Uh, whereas in the old system, yeah, you had to give your tithes. And that the children of Israel were supposed to keep the Sabbath. And they were supposed to every seventh year allow the land to go fallow. They weren't supposed to do any work in it. They weren't supposed to be planting their crops despite what the EU said, you know. They were supposed to let it go fallow. But of course they were punished because, you know, they had to, 490 years, they didn't give the land to God. And so they were taken out of the land and put into captivity for 70 years because they didn't follow the rules. <coughs> but our faith is in a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. So wherefore, consider him. And I, th I would say to you, there is no better occupation for the believer and for the unbeliever for that matter than considering our Lord Jesus Christ. It's one of the wonders of the Lord's Day meeting here. Is we can sit down and we can worship the Lord Jesus Christ. We can tell the Father what we think about the Son. You know, it's not like I was, I was in Texas once and there was this young lad and, you know, Lord bless him, he, at least he got up on his feet, but he was thanking the Lord for his pickup truck. Uh, well, I'm sure, you know, he was glad to get his pickup truck, but I think the father really wanted to hear what, we, what he thought about his son. And we have this wonderful opportunity. And, you know, there's so much material in the scripture that we can consider the Lord Jesus. But we've got two particular terms here. We are to consider the apostle 
and high priest. Now it's very unusual for the Lord Jesus Christ to be called an apostle. We tend to think of the apostle as something which is synonymous with disciples. You know, disciple, apostle, it doesn't really matter which one we use. But you know, the Holy Spirit is very careful when he is using words. And in the scripture, uh, as we, as we uh, learned on Sunday, um, uh, I'll have to confess I hadn't seen it. Uh, my son was surprised I hadn't seen it, so I was a little bit berated there. But the fact that, um, that uh, the Lord Jesus says, cast your nets, and Peter cast his nets. You know, and, and just one letter is, is, is meaningful. Because Peter was sort of thinking, well, all right, you know, almost humoring the Lord. And we can learn something from that. And the Lord Jesus, the, 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 not the Lord Jesus, the, the, the Bible here is saying apostle applied to the Lord Jesus for a purpose. The disciples were those that followed the Lord Jesus. But the apostle is somebody who is a sent messenger from God. Somebody who is sent from God. Now, the wonderful thing for the disciples was they were allowed to be those who had followed the Lord Jesus. And this made them ready to be sent to work for God. And when they were sent to work for God, you look in the, in the epistles and you will find sometimes Paul refers to himself as a bondservant. In the epistle to Philemon, that man who had a servant called Onesimus, he does not refer to himself as the apostle. Because then he would be coming as a messenger from God and he would say, do this. He's coming on the basis of, I'm a bond servant, just like this slave that's been lost. But you know, when he's speaking to the Corinthians, who have gone a little bit haywire, their morals have gone out the window, he is Paul the Apostle. He's speaking as a messenger from God, so you better listen to what he's got to say. And the Lord Jesus Christ is described as the Apostle of our profession. He is the one that God sent to speak to us. Now we've got some hint of it in the first chapter when we find God who hath in, 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 at sundry times in diverse manners spake, uh, hath in time past spoken unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. So God is speaking to us through the Lord Jesus. And if you want to know what he's saying, listen to what he says. Open your Bible. Look through Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. See what the Lord Jesus has to say. Because he's got a message. He's come from God to man. And he's come with a message. And you know, he was faithful with that message. If we have a look at John's Gospel. Um, and I think it's... Uh, goodness me, I can't remember what verse it is. John chapter 20. Um, and let's <coughs> hope I can find it. Um, the Lord Jesus is speaking where he says, As my Father um, hath sent me, so I send you. If somebody can see the verse before I get there, um, unless I've got my, my chapters wrong. Well, we're, we're, 21. Verse, chapter 21 or verse 21? Uh, oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Chapter 20, verse 21. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me. So his father has sent him. And now the disciples are going to become apostles. So I send you. And so the Lord Jesus Christ, we read his words. We read, um, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. We find that, that this, there's a new way of having a relationship with God. It's not the old way of, of, of keeping your tithes and, and just keeping the law because we know that fails. It's a completely new way. He speaks to the woman at Sike as well, and she said, I know that you, you, know, you say that um, it's Jerusalem you should worship. And he says, well, I'm going to show you that we, you know, we worship in spirit and in truth, neither in Jerusalem nor here. You know? So we worship now in a different way. We have a different relationship with God. Where does this come from? It's come from our apostle, the apostle, the Lord Jesus Christ, the message which has come from God. And we see, of course, don't we, on the cross. He, we hear those words. It is finished. The words that the Lord Jesus spoke. The message, the work, he'd come, 
He'd done it, he'd finished it, and so he was able to say, Into thy hands, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. The Lord Jesus gave his life, and all of this was the message from God. And you know, you and I need to make sure we consider him, we listen to him. This message isn't the sort of thing where, you know, sometimes you get messages on your phone, and sometimes I get a little message that tells me there's a voicemail that was there a month ago, and I've obviously ignored it. And if I ignore it a couple of days longer, it will just be wiped out. It's not that kind of message. It's the sort of message that we must not ignore. The Lord Jesus Christ has died to take away your sin and my sin. And we need to consider the apostle of our profession. But you know, the wonderful thing about it is, he's come with this message. John the Baptist was saying repent, and it was a message of repentance that the Lord Jesus came with. But you know, the wonderful thing about it is, not only is the apostle giving us this message which we've got to listen to, but he's also the high priest of our profession. Now the high priest was one who would go into the holy place in the temple and he would bring a sacrifice and he would speak to God on behalf of the people. And he had to be a man. Every high priest is taken from among men. And so here we have one is the Lord Jesus Christ who is our high priest. So he's brought us the message. He's told us what we need to do and now he's helping us do it is watching us all along the way you know the bible says and he in fact it's hebrews that says we, we don't have we have not an high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities now that might sound a little bit difficult to you but it's not really that difficult we've not got somebody that doesn't know what it's like you're going through these difficulties he knows what he's like and this is the one that will be with us every step of the way that's why I did ask, I know Gene normally ably chooses the hymns, but this was in my mind when I asked for what a friend we have in Jesus. You know, what a friend we have in Jesus. Every, we can take everything to God in prayer. You know, sometimes we've got these trials and tribulations and all these difficulties and they just seem to build up and get worse and worse. We've got a high priest that we can take them to. We've got somebody that we can talk to and say, this is my difficulty. This is my problem. I don't know what to do, Lord. But he's surely he's not interested in us. Well, you go to the epistle of Peter and he say, Cast all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. The Lord Jesus Christ isn't just saying, right, this is what you need to do to get saved and you're on your own. He is not only the apostle, he's also the high priest of our profession. And we really should give him consideration. Now why is he writing this in the epistle to the Hebrews? Well, of course, the Hebrews would say, well, I don't know what you're talking about a messenger for, because we've got a great one, Moses. He was, in a sense, an apostle. He was a messenger from God. And he was there to, to help take the people out of the uh, captivity in Egypt and, and lead them to be the, if I'll use the term, to be the captain of their salvation. The one who's going to lead them out of Egypt into their rest in the promised land. No matter what the Romans decided to call it, calling it Palestine, it's still the land that God has given them. And no matter what troubles and what the United Nations managed to pass as resolutions, one day they will be there and they will be there peaceably. Because the Lord Jesus shall be reigning over them. But that's, that's an aside. Moses, he was their apostle. He's the one that brought the message. He was sent by God with the message. Took it to Pharaoh, said, you know, we, we, we I think it was a... Was that a chorus or a musical or something? You know, let my people go. Um, but I, I know, I don't think Moses sang it to Pharaoh. But, you know, Moses is there. He's saying, look, we want to go. Two days, was it two days or three days? Three, three days, yes. You should have, should have remembered that, right? Three days journey that they might worship. So here he is, he's coming with a message from God. And yet, so we've got this apostle. And, and as for a high priest, we've got Aaron. Aaron was a high priest. He used to go in with the, with the, <coughs> the blood. Uh, in, into the Holy of Holies. So we've got Moses, we've got Aaron. But ah, here we've got one who has both in, in one person. He is both the apostle and the high priest. And we're about to see in the next verses how he is superior to Moses. We'll superior, we'll superior, I don't know what that word is. We'll see later on in the, in the book, if the, the Lord spares us, how he is superior to Aaron as well, and Aaron's priesthood. But we'll see in this chapter how the Lord Jesus Christ is superior to Moses. Now, Moses, 
amongst the children of Israel was definitely one that was venerated. Um, if Moses had been a Catholic, he'd been Saint Moses, you know, that, and they would have had little icons and pictures of him, but uh, they knew they weren't supposed to do that, but it came pretty close to that in what the children of Israel, what the Hebrews thought of Moses. He was their superman, and they thought he was fantastic, and Moses was a great man. However, as we start to look at Moses, we do see that he was a sinful man, and then he made some mistakes. Now, I, I think we learn from these mistakes in Scripture. I know some people are very quick to say, well, Peter did this wrong, and that wrong, and the other wrong. You know, if I was, if I was half the man Peter was, then, you know, there'd be a great work done for the Lord. Uh, Peter was a great man of God. Peter's heart was in the right place. He just sometimes got his mouth operating before he got his brain in gear. You know, he just did things impulsively, and he made mistakes. Uh, but Peter was a wonderful Christian and a great man of God. But we can learn from his mistakes. We're going to learn from some of Moses' mistakes. But don't, you know, so, sort of, what's the word, slag him off. You know, he was, he, he was not really a bad fellow. He made some mistakes. But Moses was a great man. No wonder they thought he was wonderful. Let's have a look at him. Let, we find in this verse here, he says, let's have a look at... Uh, verse 2, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. Now, reading the New Testament, you might think that Moses was faithful in his own personal house. But if you look at the scriptures, you will find that we are looking somewhere else. Now, if you can find the book of Numbers, which is the fourth book in the Old Testament, fourth book in the Bible as well, is... Um, Numbers chapter 12 and verse 7. And here we'll get the clarification about whose house he's talking about. Excuse me, just take the jacket off here. Numbers chapter 12 verse 7. Uh, and it says, My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. It's particularly to do with the tabernacle. Moses was given the details of the tabernacle. You know, it would be quite nice if we studied the tabernacle sometime. Uh, Moses was given the details of the tabernacle. And Moses was faithful in passing on everything that he heard. He didn't think, well, you know, I think this is a nice idea, but, you know, I've got a better idea. You know, you, you, you ask a builder to do something and they'll do it. And then they'll say, well, actually, I think this is bit better and they'll do it differently. You know, he was faithful in all his house in passing on the instructions that God gave him to the letter. Because every single bit was important. He was absolutely faithful in all these things. And so Moses was faithful, and as was the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus was faithful. The Lord Jesus said, as we, as we looked, um, you know, he did everything that his father sent him to do. But let's have a look at Moses. Let's have a look at the same book, Numbers, fourth book of the Bible. Numbers chapter 20. And again, verse 7. Numbers chapter 20, verse 7. And we'll read a little bit about Moses. You can tell it's, you know, although Moses wrote this, if you write an autobiography, you do things to make yourself look good, don't you? Um, and Moses... You can tell it was inspired by God, what Moses wrote, because here's a little bit that doesn't make Moses look quite so good. But remember, let's not say, oh, you know, Moses wasn't that good after all. Let's remember he was a great man of God, but we're just learning from his mistake here. Numbers chapter 20, verse 7, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron and thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. So thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Here now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believed me not, 
to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Now Moses had once before been asked to strike the rock and water came out. And Moses, instead of relying on God, who said, just speak to the rock, he relied on his experience. It worked that way last time. That's what I think is going to work this time. And he did not believe that if he just spoke to the rock, it would bring forth water. Moses here, because of his frustration. Now you've got to give it to Moses. Moses put up with arguably the biggest bunch of moaners that we've ever seen in history. He was there for 40 years and they were complaining almost every step of the way. Almost as soon as they've been rescued. You know, you brought us out into the desert to die. And then they get water and the water's bitter. And they're complaining right from the beginning. So it's understandable why Moses is really angry with them and says, Here now ye rebels. But he disobeyed God and he didn't believe God and he made a mistake. And he was punished for that mistake by not being allowed to enter into the promised land. The comparison here is with the Lord Jesus. The superiority of the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus does not get frustrated with us. The Lord Jesus does not, as it were, lose his temper with us. The Lord Jesus is constantly faithful. He is constantly there. It says in Hebrews, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. If it had been up to Moses, Moses actually did have the chance to get rid of the lot of them. Uh, and it says a lot about Moses that in, rather, you know, God said, well, I'll raise it up, you know, a seed to you and you can be like the, the, the king, if you like. But Moses said, no, no, I'll carry on. Uh, and he didn't have them wiped out. But, you know, Moses, there must have been days when Moses thought, you know, I wish I'd, I wish I'd taken the chance, you know. I wish I'd said yes and got rid of them. But the Lord Jesus is a faithful high priest and never does he have a weak moment like Moses great man Moses I, I really can't emphasize enough that I'm not trying to knock Moses but I'm just trying to show you that the Lord Jesus Christ is superior in all ways no matter what you've done no matter what you've said no matter where you've been no matter how far you've strayed if you come back he is ready to receive you know you look at the prodigal son the prodigal son had, you know his father he divided his inheritance uh, not a big problem for David really but you know he divided his inheritance got all those loads of money and off he goes and spends it all and he comes back and he says you know make me like one of thy hired servants he'd taken his father's money he'd wasted his father's money he'd gone off with wild righteous living and he comes back and what do we see the father sees him a great way off you know that tells me that the father was watching for him you know it wasn't oh I didn't expect to see you sort of thing you can almost imagine that every day he's looking, waiting, hoping that he's going to realise that the place where he should be is back at home. And you know we have a faithful high priest who will never leave you, never forsake you. He's not like Moses, he's not going to say, here now you rebels. Now he might, he might punish us, he might chastise us. You know the Bible says that's quite right. But he's not going to leave us and so we have a superior apostle of our profession and a superior uh, high priest now the next section that um, I would look at I think will take us uh, a, a little bit of time and I know it's perhaps slightly earlier than usual <clears throat> but rather than keep going till nine o'clock I think I'll draw it to a close there but the key thing here is consider I love that word just think about the Lord Jesus just think about what he's done for you just think about what is you know don't forget in, in in the garden of gethsemane it was if it be possible let this cup pass from me nevertheless not my will but thy will be done he knew that the only way for you and i to be saved for the only way to deal with sin was for him to go to calvary's cross and when we see the physical sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ, I think that just gives us a little taste of what he suffered in those three hours of darkness. When we find in the Old Testament, it says, all thy waves and thy billows passed over me. When he was treated as sin itself, when 
God poured out his, the punishment for the things we've done wrong on him. Consider him our apostle and high priest of our profession. Shall we just stop at that?